to Great Loop Radio, brought to you by America's Great Loop Cruisers Association. We're dedicated to sharing Great Loop information and inspiration with those actively cruising, planning for, or dreaming about a Great Loop adventure. I'm Kim Russo. I'm the director of AGLCA. Today, we're diving into a topic that we got a lot of questions about. Uh, about two weeks ago, we did a Story of Our Loop podcast. And the boat was a Navigator 4400 and the gold loopers were talking about they didn't anchor a lot because their boat was very active at anchor. And that is actually the story here aboard the perch as well. And one of the reasons we don't anchor a whole lot is because the boat swings a lot uh, quickly and far <laughs> on the hook. And it makes it, you know, a little bit of a challenging overnight at an anchorage when you're wondering the whole time if you're just swinging or if you're actually dragging anchor. So, uh, got a lot of questions about what boats do that, what boats don't, and I'm certainly not the person to be answering those, but Curtis Stokes with Curtis Stokes and Associates is somebody who knows a whole lot about hull design and has experience in all facets of the boating industry, so he has kindly agreed to join me for the discussion today and share some insight. Before we jump into that, I do want to take a moment to recognize and thank our Admiral sponsors who support AGLCA at the highest level. They are Curtis Stokes and Associates, Passage Maker Trawler Fest, Skipper Bob Publications, and Waterway Guide Media. As always, we encourage our listeners and viewers to support these businesses that support the Great Loop. And of course, as I mentioned, one of those Admiral sponsors is Curtis Stokes and Associates. So I'd like to officially welcome Curtis Stokes back to the Great Loop Radio podcast. Curtis, thanks for being here. You bet. Thank you. Good to be here again. Yeah, and I know you're coming to us from your home in Maryland. So hopefully it's a beautiful day there as it is here on the Great Lakes. I'm in Maryland with Florida weather, hot and humid. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, the Great Lakes have been um, a little bit chillier from what I understand this season mm -hmm. than normal, but um, it's been beautiful. So we've been very fortunate to be spending the summer cruising around here. Um, but as I said in the intro, one of the, the things about the perch is we don't anchor a whole lot. And part of that is Michael does not sleep at all when we anchor. He says it's from his <laughs> Navy days that somebody has to be on watch. Um, but one of the issues is that the boat swings substantially. And the, the perch, of course, for those of you who have not been following along, is a um, 410 Silverton. And so it's a motor yacht. And when we did this podcast a few weeks ago with another motor yacht, a Navigator 4400, they mentioned that same issue. So they only anchored a few times on their loop. We've um, anchored several times you know, around Charleston before we left to get more comfortable with it and have anchored a few times on the loop where it was kind of necessary or gave us an advantage for starting the next morning, but it's not something we regularly do. So, you know, kind of in the basic terms, Curtis, um, if you could, well, the question I was about to ask is if you could kind of tell us, you know, a little bit about what boats or why some boats are more active. But before you answer that, go ahead and give some of your background um, for those who are not familiar with you, because of course you've sold, uh, help people buy and sell many great loop boats, but also have an extensive background before that with boats. Sure. Um, well, I've been on boats all my life, like so many people, but uh, my father was extremely active boater and uh, kind of almost forced it on me. But uh, from small boats to large yachts, uh, I've, I've run, you know, all kinds of different boats and anchored out. Um, all over the world, I was a captain on a mega yacht, uh, several mega yachts, and went around the world two and a half times. Uh, and that's how Jill and I met. Uh, but we anchored out in just about every situation imaginable. Granted, you know, we were on large yachts where we had a lot of crew that could stand watch. Uh, we always stood watch, you know, 24 hours even with guests during the day. Uh, but we got a lot of experience at it. I. Uh, you know, these days when I get time off from uh, working, I, I'm on smaller boats anchoring out all the time, either fishing or hunting. Uh, so anchoring is just kind of one of those things that, you know, it's just part of my boating. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a little complicated for some people to understand who aren't used to boating or fairly new to boating. And uh, it's, it's not just, uh, you know, buying any boat and going out and dropping the hook. Right. And that's, you know, I, I think that's probably what piqued some people's interest when we had this, a brief discussion about this a couple of weeks ago and why I got so many questions is that, as you very well know, there are a lot of people out there looking for a Great Loop boat. And as prices for boats has gone up a bit <laughs> during the pandemic, because it's such a seller's market, um, some people are looking, well, we can save some money on the loop by anchoring a lot. Uh, so the last thing they want to do is go and kind of uh, 
pay for a boat that they are then going to be uncomfortable anchoring in. And I think that's, that's why this raised so much interest. So, you know, tell us kind of in the most basic terms, why some boats are more active than others and, you know, active that they're swinging on the hook as opposed to just a little bit more still and stable. Sure. Well, I think you have to start with the fact that a boat is an unstable platform and it is going to move to some degree. And for one person, that may be extremely active. And for another person, it may be fairly stable. So uh, there's some subjectiveness, you know, and, and I guess your own physical makeup as far as whether you're prone to seasickness or, you know, excessive movement. Um, but to me, the things that come into play are wind, current, and uh, naval architecture, design, and, you know, the shape of the hull. And when it comes to wind and uh, current, also, to me, landmass uh, comes into effect because what some people don't realize is you can have an island with a cove and you can be up in the cove and be uncomfortable because of what we call wraparound. You know, you're out of the wind, you think you're out of the current, but the wind and currents are actually wrapping around into the cove and affecting you. So there, everybody has um, is correct to assume that it is a little complicated. It's not just clear cut as to what type of boat will do what in what type of circumstances. Uh, lighter boats tend to be more active than heavier boats. You know, but in saying that, it, it comes back to the naval architecture. How much keel is there? When you look at, you know, on a survey, I, I remark a lot of times to my clients, look how there's no keel and the, the props are the lowest point of, of the bottom. Or look at this keel and look at this keel on this trawler where the prop is in, you know, uh, protected to some degree in the keel. All that's going to affect how the boat reacts to wind and current. Um, the other thing is, especially you know, for the wind, is enclosures. Uh, you have these motor yachts and trawlers, uh, sun decks especially, that have full Isinglass enclosures, and it's like a big sail. Uh, so they're going to move around more. There's no question about it. Um, the amount of freeboard, you know, again, windage, uh, a sailboat versus a sun deck motor yacht is going to be completely different in any anchorage. Uh, your draft, you know, is affected more by current. Uh, again, a sailboat's going to be affected more by current than, a, you know, a, a light motor yacht like your Silverton. Um, picture the old classic Grand Banks. You know, they had steadying sails. That mast and boom were really not so much for the dav as a davit, but they were more for a steadying sail. And some of the older ones still have the original steadying sail there. Uh, you'll see some sailboats at anchor actually using the, the main, you know, portion of the main for a steadying sail. So, uh, but the naval architecture, again, displacement, you know, versus a planing hull. Again, that comes to that draft issue and how it's affected by current. Um, so every boat's going to be different and every person's going to be different. Uh, I, I, I ran for years, I ran fed ships. Uh, it's a very famous uh, brand of motor yacht built in Holland. And years ago, Fedship used to build classic motor yachts and they used to try to keep the roll period. Every boat has a roll period. That's from one extreme on one side to the other extreme on one side when a boat rolls. And you can count that in seconds, hopefully seconds and not minutes. And um, it was always four to six seconds. Most builders would build their, their vessels to you know, fit in that category. And Fedship one day uh, decided to do a study, a very extensive study, um, and it wasn't done in a day, but they looked at the effects on humans of roll periods, and it was phenomenal. Uh, they, they really came out and said four to six seconds is actually the worst roll period for human, most human beings because your center of gravity is so low and the boat is so seaworthy and stable that it's a fast roll period that affects your, your stability in your inner ear more than uh, a longer roll period. So they started building yachts, raising the center of gravity and finding that sweet spot where I, I ran one, it was 180 footer and the, the roll period was about 11 and a half seconds. And that's wow. phenomenal compared to four to six seconds. So you had this very long, slow roll. 
but it would almost put you to sleep when you're out in the ocean. You know, it was just, it was, it was so slow. Uh, didn't feel as seaworthy as the one that I was working on and, you know, had four to six seconds, but people didn't get as seasick. It was amazing the difference. So, you know, you have to look at, again, the naval architecture of the individual boat. And if your center of gravity is higher than one that's much lower, that's going to be a big factor uh, along with the, the, you know, displacement and, and everything else. Yeah. So that is super interesting as somebody who gets seasick very easily. <laughs> interesting that there have been studies on what that, that role period should be. Um, so, you know, in the perfect world, all things being equal, if you took a few different boats and put them in the same anchorage at the same time, um, you know, I, again, we're generalizing here, but can you kind of put into specific categories, you know, do trawlers typically um, sit still more so than motor yachts or, you know, uh, of course, some of the smaller tugs are really popular and of course they're lighter. So, you know, turning the conversation a little bit towards looping boats for somebody who plans to anchor out a lot that is still kind of wide open on what they're looking for. Can you offer some guidance on generalizations again, but categories that perhaps are uh, less active than others? Sure. Um, so uh, we've taken the word trawler and expanded or broadened its uh, usage quite a bit over the years in the marketing, both manufacturers and, and uh, yacht brokers to get more boats sold as trawlers that to me are really just motor yachts dressed up as trawlers. So if you take the true original idea of a trawler, uh, you know, a displacement hull, uh, slower, uh, heavier boat, and compare that to, I'm going to pick on your Silverton, mm -hmm. you know, it's a lighter, higher horsepower motor yacht built for higher speeds. So your center of gravity is going to be different. Your, you know, all the naval architecture is completely different. And so you are going to feel a big difference. But in saying that, you know, you can always take something like that. And like you said, we're generalizing. You can take something like that and say, but what if? So you take a Katie Krogan 42, uh, you know, foot trawler and with soft chimes. And that boat typically rolls more than a very broad beam, hard shine boat. But it will be a slower roll that might be more comfortable to some people versus a short chop uh, roll that on that type of boat or take a, a, a power cat or sail cat, you know, uh, like the Aquila. I mean, th that's going to be a very stable platform, but you put a certain person on a boat like that and they're going to feel a total difference and not feel comfortable and others are going to absolutely love it. So it still comes down to the individual, but yeah, the whole design uh, in, in each individual boat is going to be different. And that's the problem in an anchorages. If you're in a crowded anchorage, and you're trying to compensate for your sail uh, area and how, you know, through like more chain or uh, multiple anchors and things like that, you have to worry about wind shifts and how other boats are sitting at anchor too. I used to run a 143 foot aluminum, uh, foot aluminum built yacht and we would sail quite a bit at anchor because we were much lighter than the heavy steel Dutch built yachts all around us, like I mentioned, fed ship. So we're all in the anchorage together and we'd have to worry about how our distance off of each other is, you know, our closest point of approach CPA and uh, wind shifts and current shifts and all of that. So we were constantly keeping watch on that type of thing. There are some things that will help reduce the amount of sail at anchor, uh, but it, it also will be affected by how many boats are in the anchorage and, you know, what type of boats. Yeah. And, and I, I do also want to mention, it's not all about the back and forth rocking and, and then the seasickness feeling. Um, on our Silverton, it's more of a swing on the hook back and forth. So for me to get seasick, I'm completely comfortable. I sleep like a baby. The motion actually is kind of relaxing to me. To Michael, it's a constant. I mean, it swings fast. It swings on a very wide arc. Um, when you're kind of sitting in the salon watching the world go by, you feel like you're underway. Um, it is moving <laughs> fast. <laughs> um, but for me, when I, you know, I go to sleep, I'm fine with that. For Michael, not at all, because he's worrying the entire, you know, anchors alarms, alarms are set, all the things, but he is still worried constantly that the trees going by are actually going by because we are moving down the river. Um, 
so you know again i don't know if certain boats tend to swing back and forth on the hook versus roll um but for those you know listening or watching and thinking oh i get seasick i never want to anchor for us at least it's not a seasickness issue it's a the boat appears to be moving very quickly so that's well, a really weird thing if you look out the side windows, it's just like a car. You're going to see more movement than versus forward or aft, mm -hmm. uh, typically. Um, the other thing is, you know, sailing at anchor is one thing. It's the surge at the end that can bother some people uh, where the boat is sailing and then reaches that maximum point where either the anchor road has you know, stretched out as far as it will go or the nylon road has stretched and you suddenly get a jerk and then it starts coming the other way that can bother people too and it's not you know healthy on the equipment uh certainly right and i think that's his biggest fear is that because we get that substantial jerk at the end of that arc um that the equipment will fail so um we've we've spoken to um rudy sachet about it we've spoken to scott and karen duvall about it who um you know anchored so much during their loop and, and has have taught many people to anchor um, and, you know, their boat did the same thing, just not to the same degree. Um, theirs was a Meridian, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, their, their post-loop boat. Um, right. I think it was a Meridian. Yeah. Um, and we spent some time on the hook with them on that boat. And, you know, compared to the, the Silverton, it was not that much of a swing. So it was just has been interesting to me for a long time, the differences, um, but not something I've been able to, you know, really dive into so i'm glad to have this conversation today um any suggestions on what you can do with a boat that's swinging a lot or is very active at anchor to try and remedy that we haven't found anything we thought a mooring balls might straighten that situation out a little bit does not <laughs> have the same experience on a mooring ball bridle doesn't change it but again that's experience on a single boat so any suggestions you have if someone does plan to anchor and has a boat that they're finding to be pretty active at anchor, anything at all that can improve it? There are a few things and you have to experiment just like you guys have done. Every boat's going to be different. So, you know, you mentioned uh, the bridle anchor snubber or bridle uh, helps a lot of boats. Uh, a single um, bridle or snubber will help some boats and not others. For example, that 143 foot aluminum yacht that we, we, uh, that I ran, we had a single uh, early on and the boat, so the anchor's going this way and the boat would would always ride, you know, to one side, whatever side that we had this number on uh, so that it would sail almost even more. So we would use multiple anchors. Now, you know, again, with multiple anchors, you've got to, uh, you've got to have some anchor watch going on uh, because if the tide change or current switch shifts or the wind shifts you know you can get them tangled up and we've had that happen you know in, in previous times but ideally you want uh two anchors out about 50 to 60 degrees apart and uh the more anchor chain your your boat can handle the better uh the anchor chain has a lot to do with your holding power and how you hold uh you know in in the different current and wind uh, some boats can't handle all that weight up front like that. Some of the lighter boats, especially if they're a little down in the bow, you can't put that much weight up there. So you're going to have to live with some nylon road in addition to the anchor chain. But if you can have all anchor chain and then have a snubber, and ideally you have the snubber, if you have an uh, a, a eye bolt down on the stem near the waterline and you can run you know, your snubber or your bridle from there, that keeps the angle down lower to the waterline, which helps. Uh, otherwise, you want a Y shape. So from the furthest cleats apart, creating a Y to keep that bow into the wind, that'll help to some degree. Um, it, it's you know, pretty much, that's about all you can really do. Uh, you can try a stern anchor, but in a lot of anchorages, you can't do that. Uh, I, what I recommend is when people buy a boat is they go out and practice during the day for a couple of hours, and you mentioned it, um, and do that over and over again and try, if you have multiple anchors, try different anchorages. You know, if, if you have a CQR and a Danforth, try them in different situations at different times. I can see what one holds and what type of bottom. Um, 
The other thing is, used to, and I, I, for the life of me, I can't remember the, the name of the product, but we used to have a large orange viewer that had a, a piece of glass in one end and uh, an eyepiece on the other. And we could take the tender out and put it in the water and see clearly to the bottom. Granted, it was Caribbean or you know Great Lakes, clear water. But we could see the bottom to see where our anchor was so that we made sure we weren't taking out any coral reef or any grass beds where we could. Uh, so something like that sometimes, you know, anchor and then go take your tender and see how the anchor's behaving with the boat swinging around, you know, and you'll see the different uh, ways anchors, uh, the different types of anchors, uh, you know, act. Yeah, right. it's, it's all about practice. It's just like docking. Um, you've got to get used to the boat and how it reacts to the different, uh, you know, forces on it. Yeah. Great information. Um, let's take a quick break and play a message from one of our sponsors. When we come back, just a couple of, uh, you know, kind of general questions about looper boats and, and the ground tackle they have for anchoring. Um, and if we still have time, we'll get a little bit of a market update from you while we've got you here. So we'll be back in a moment. Winter Harbor Marina is located on the Oneida River, 1.5 miles west of Oneida Lake in Brewerton, New York, just minutes from Syracuse International Airport. Winter Harbor offers the lowest diesel fuel and gas prices from New York City to Canada. If you find a lower posted documented price, they will match it. Their amenities include complimentary courtesy vehicle, 24-hour pay-at-the-pump fueling, dockside water and cable TV, pristine bathrooms and showers, and emergency haul-out service. For more information, call 315-676-9276 or visit www.winterharborllc.com. Winter Harbor is a proud commander sponsor of AGLCA. We're back on Great Loop Radio. My guest today is Curtis Stokes with Curtis Stokes and Associates. They are an admiral sponsor of AGLCA and a yacht brokerage specializing in Great Loop boats. We um, are talking today about anchoring and some of the different uh, naval architecture, some of the different conditions that might cause boats to be active at anchor. I want to talk a little bit, Curtis, uh, since you have helped people buy so many looper boats. What do you find out there for somebody who's looking for their boat and planning to anchor a lot? Are most of the loop boats that you find pretty well equipped for anchoring? Do they have all the ground tack tackle they need or should people be planning to upgrade that if they're going to anchor a lot? Most boats that I see are adequate for general anchoring, occasional anchoring, but aren't set up by the manufacturer for serious anchoring uh, and haven't been modified by anybody. Um, some of the trawlers, certainly people have spent more time focusing on anchoring and are truly set up, but no, most of the, the boats are just average. Uh, I think most of the boats could use a larger anchor, uh, even in some cases larger windlass. And again, you know, I've seen boats with 20, 30 foot of anchor chain in the rest nylon road, and they could clearly handle more anchor chain that would help considerably. Um, and getting, getting someone who really knows what they're doing to help with that is important, you know, in your connections and, and, uh, and your setup. One other thing about the snubber that I didn't mention was one of the reasons to use it too is to take the stress off the windlass. You know, they, a lot, I watch a lot of people who will leave uh, the anchor chain on the windlass and the boats riding back and forth and surging. That's a huge amount of stress on that windlass in that deck that is typically cored. So it may not pull out, you know, that, that would be extreme, but think about the stress going back and forth, the torque on the bolts going into that cord and even fiberglass that eventually widen the holes and allow water intrusion into the coring. And that's why we find so many of the older boats have coring issues up around the anchor windlass and around the foot pedals. You know, they were never embedded properly, uh, the foot controls up there. So uh, you want to get that stress off there with a snubber or bridle if you can, uh, ideally. So, okay. but uh, yeah, most of them need an upgrade. Um, and, you know, there's some books out there that people could read. Uh, you could hire a training captain. Uh, to learn more about anchoring, you could go, let's say Southwest Florida yachts, charter a boat for a weekend or a week and have a training captain and anchor out all over and try different scenarios. 
Um, th there are ways to learn ahead of time, you know, rather than spending a fortune on an anchor that you find you don't like, you know, try it on, on say, some charter boats. Right. Great idea. Um, any specific books or other resources that people can turn to if they want to kind of brush up on anchoring, you know, not practical practice, um, but, you know, kind of anchoring theory and information before setting out? Yeah, I uh, actually went and looked through my books that Jill still lets me keep on the shelves and, and clutter. Um, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Rudy and, and Jill Seychez, um their book. Uh, I think it's uh, Ground Tackler's Apprentice is the name of their book. book. Mm -hmm. Probably the best known book uh, out there is The Complete Book of Anchoring and Mooring by Earl Hines, or Hines Hines, I think his name is. Uh, I see that quite a bit, and I've had that for years. Um, there's the Complete Anchoring Handbook, um, and then Happy Hooking, The Art of Anchoring, the Blackwells, you know, did that one. Mm -hmm. um, those are the ones that, you know, I've, I've had over the years and have, have read and, uh, you know, I see most often. Okay, great. So uh, with that topic pretty well covered at this point, um, with the few minutes we have left, why don't you go ahead and, uh, you know, kind of give us a little bit of a market update, if you will. Um, you know, any signs that this seller's market is starting to slow down? Uh, for about the last two months, a, a number of brokers have contacted me asking if they're if we're seeing the slowdown. They are. Um, we haven't, thank goodness. I mean, we're we're blessed that we're still extremely busy, as you know, Michael, with all his flying around uh, trying to keep up with it. So I, I do see signs that it's slowing down a little bit. I think some sellers got carried away with their pricing. Um, uh, so, you know, some of the sellers have had to reduce their prices. I, I hear people say to me, well, I see lots of uh, price reductions. Well, you do because some of the prices got so crazy uh, that they just had to bring them down to a more reasonable level. Um, I still see people getting very good prices for their boats. I don't see a huge amount of inventory coming on the market yet. We're getting more inventory, but when we list a boat that is priced right and in good condition, it's typically getting quite a bit of activity and selling fairly quickly. Um, I am seeing a number of boats with condition issues, especially moisture in the decks, and that's turning buyers off, uh, lack of maintenance on equipment. Um, so th there's definitely some a few things that are catching people on surveys and frustrating sellers. So the boats are staying on the market and instead of investing more money into these repairs, people are dropping their prices to get them sold, reflecting condition issues. Uh, so they're, they're, it's the same market. You know, all these issues are coming into play. Uh, if rates keep going up, sure, that's, it, it has to affect the market some way, somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're still, new, they're still ordered way, way out. Uh, we're still getting a tremendous number of inquiries. I'd say it's more unstable now than it was where it was just a constant flow. Now we'll have one day we'll be extremely busy and another day we'll be quieter. But if you average it out, it's still very, very strong and we're still selling a lot of boats. They just have to be priced accordingly. And if you know something's broken or you know, know something that's an issue, then you know, try to deal with it if you can before you put it on the market. Yeah, we are seeing um, a lot of loopers cross their wake. Um, and, and as you well know, Curtis, and most of our listeners probably know, many loopers do sell their boat when they're finished. They either are moving on to something else like RVing, or a lot of them are either downsizing because they're not going to be aboard as for as long of a time as they continue to cruise. Some are getting bigger boats because they fell in love with this lifestyle and want to continue to do the long-term cruising thing. Regardless of the reasons, many loopers do sell the boat when they finish the loop. We are seeing a lot of loopers... Um, reporting their completions. I think a combination of people who waited until the pandemic was a little further behind us than it was last year and the year before, and people who are waiting for the Canadian US border to reopen in both directions are finishing up some of the cruising and the plans that they had made and, and put on hold. So are you starting to see that? Are you starting to see you know more loopers reaching out and, and wanting to sell as they're, than we were seeing this time last year? Few. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but again, they're selling fairly quickly just because of the backlog of buyers that we represent. Um, <clears throat> we have been anticipating and expecting more inventory, like you said, as people cross their wake. And, and uh, this fall, we're hoping we're going to get a lot more inventory, especially main ship 40s. And you know, we could sell those all day long, uh, again, at the right price, though. But uh, 
we still have a lot of buyers, so you know they're, they're, it's the market's not crashing or anything like that. Uh, it's still very very busy. Uh, I'm negotiating right now on the other computer probably four offers on boats. And, you know, people are, are cautious and, you know, we had one fall through because the buyer said, well, the market's changed, you know, I want $30,000 off. And we're like, well, what was on the survey that justified that? Well, nothing, you know, it was just the market. Um, so, you know, stuff like that comes up and it's frustrating, but um, it's still a pretty strong market. And there's just, there's not an overwhelming amount of inventory out there, uh, but there's more. Thank you for that update, Curtis, and thanks for chiming in on the whole uh, active boats at anchor issue. We appreciate that. Um, we hope to have you back again soon. Thanks. Yeah. And to everyone who's watched and listened this week, thank you for being with us. We'll be back next week with another episode of Great Loop Radio. Until then, safe cruising. <laughs>